to see if we can recycle some of these drugs, provided uh, safety isn't compromised, uh, recycle some of these drugs to Africa and elsewhere. Before we move to the next item of business, members will wish to join me in welcome to the gallery Mr Rafael Catatonia, President of the Regional Council of Lombardy. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the Government's programme. <laughs> Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Last year, the Scottish Government again missed its accident and emergency target, meaning that thousands of Scots had to wait for more than four hours for treatment. The First Minister's response was to lower the target. According to Audit Scotland this week, the Scottish Government is not just missing the original target, it's now missing the new, easier-to-reach target as well. More patients are suffering. Last year, the First Minister promised action. This year, we learned those waiting more than four hours for treatment has tripled on his watch. When will his actions start to prove effective? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Well, well, of course, uh, Audit Scotland were looking at 12-13 in, in the statistics they were giving. But, uh, so, well, it's the, same, it's the same year that Joanne Lamont's talking about. But let, let me first say what we're doing about the situation, because that's the real issue. I, I don't know if uh, Joanne Lamont heard uh, Dr Mark McKechnie, the Vice Chair of the College of Emergency Medicine, on the radio this morning. What he said is, we've had a lot of support and investment in the last 18 months from the government. And we're beginning, I hope, to feel and see the effects of some of these changes. 12-13 was a hugely tough year for the emergency services of the National Health Service in Scotland. Uh, we had a substantial number of ward closures through norovirus. Uh, but the emergency action plan announced by the Health Secretary uh, has been welcomed by the profession, as indeed has the substantial increase in the number of consultants and staff and facilities uh, around Scotland. Uh, and working together, we're going to bring about the sort of improvement uh, that Scotland requires and the patients of Scotland deserves. That is what is happening in the statistics already. Uh, and if uh, Joanne Lamont was fair about it, she would note that Audit Scotland remarks on the substantial improvement uh, since the yearly statistics ending in the financial year 1230. Joanne Lamont. Yes, but Audit Scotland were pointing out that the improvement was against the worst ever statistics in relation to this matter. And I know the First Minister will have plenty of facts and figures in there that proves that there's not really a problem. But we know in our hospitals there is a problem because healthcare workers are telling us so. So let's hear what patients think. Margaret Watt, Chairwoman of the Scottish Patients Association, said people have died as they couldn't get into hospital because they were kept waiting in A and E. The distress it causes patients and families is huge, but the situation seems to get worse year on year. I have never known it as bad as this, and our national treasure, the NHS, is becoming a nightmare for patients. Last year alone, more than 100,000 people had to wait for more than four hours, more than half a working day. And nearly 1,500 people waited more than 12 hours for treatment. The First Minister has been in office for seven years. Why have waiting times trebled on his watch? First Minister. Well, I, I don't know how familiar Joanne Lamont is with the statistics, but uh, since she said that, and I quoted, I think, the waiting times were the worst ever in A&E, &E, uh, let me just correct her. I'll cover the statistics exactly, uh, and then hopefully she'll be able to admit how wrong she was. She was right in quoting the statistics for 12-13. There were 103,782 people waiting for more than four hours. That is exactly the situation we are trying to tackle. That is out of a total attendances at A&E of 1,618,610. Now, let me say again, we are seeking to tackle these figures and bring them down to what we believe is more acceptable levels. But she said that these were the worst figures ever. Now, let me give her the figures for 2006-07, when Joanne Lamont was a minister. There were 1,342,737 attendances, some 300,000 less than in 12-13. The number of people waiting more than four hours was 125,753. 
I know that Joanne Lamont has heard these figures. Will she withdraw the suggestion that the 12-13 year was the worst ever, since clearly it wasn't? Will she acknowledge that while we are trying to improve the performance, it is substantially better than when she was a minister? And will she start agreeing with us to concentrate on the action plan which will serve the people and patients of our community in the best possible way we can? The degree of complacency in that response is staggering. Let's go back to a comfort zone that a politician makes a debating point rather than respond to what patients are saying, rather than responding to what patients are saying, what staff are saying, and what Audit Scotland is saying too. The reality is the First Minister does not seem to understand are actually care about the problem. We have a social care crisis which is fueling an A&E crisis. People attending A&E need a bed, but they can't get them because patients are being parked in inappropriate wards, waiting to be discharged, but with nowhere to go. Hard-working nurses and doctors are not to blame. They are doing their best. Is the First Minister going to get serious about this crisis or is he just going to fiddle with the target again? First Minister. Well, I think Joanne Lamont should accept it is rather more than a debating point to point out she is fundamentally mentally mistaken in her claim that 12 13, well, I am afraid 125,753 is a much bigger figure than the, the one she cited. Now, she accuses me of complacency, and let me say I reject that totally. The Health Secretary has set out the action plan, which has been widely welcomed by health professionals. This government, unlike the Labour government, Pledge to protect real spending in the National Health Service, and we have done so. But if uh, Joanne Lamont, and this, this last December, the figure in terms of December and the heart of, uh, of winter increased to 93 per cent of patients who were being seen within the four hours, we want to get that figure higher to the interim target of 95 per cent and then on to 98 per cent. But if she wants to hear about complacency, uh, then perhaps she should recall when she was a minister and Andy Kerr was health minister, it's quite recent history, when the figure was 87.5 per cent. 87.5 per cent. That figure was hailed by Andy Kerr as showing that the vast majority of A&E departments are meeting their four-hour target. Investment in the NHS is paying off. So I think in terms of her and her party's credibility, she should explain why, when she was a minister, if 87.5 per cent was wonderful, why 93 per cent under this government is such a disaster. Will she accept that, yeah. thanks to the hard-working yeah. professionals in the National Health Service, there is an improvement, an improvement that yeah. we intend to drive up further thanks to the investment plan? But will she acknowledge that when she comes to this chamber and makes up figures because she can't substantiate her point, then she and her party are fundamentally lacking in any credibility on the National Health Service. Joanne Lamont. Order. Lamont. The fact that the SNP backbenchers so warmly respond to that answer tells us everything about the problem we've got. Because Dr. Nicky Thompson, Order. Dr. Nicky Thompson, who's chair of the BMA's Scottish Consultants, said medical staff are working under considerable strain to try to maintain high quality care in an overstretched system. Clearly, this is not sustainable. But what we get from the First Minister with an unsustainable NHS, a First Minister coming up with unsustainable answers. For let's be honest about what's happening here and what the Scottish Government's approach is. It is revealed in this line within the Audit Scotland report. It says, the Scottish Government has indicated it will review the 95% interim target after September 2014. Oh. What could possibly be happening in September 2014 that matters more? Well, we are not prepared to wait for his referendum before we make sure that the ill and the injured don't have to wait for treatment. 
Isn't it the case that the First Minister cares more about the constitution of our country than the health of our people? First Minister. Uh, in dealing with the situation, we've announced the £50 million uh, emergency care plan. We're reviewing the 95% figure towards the end of the year because we want to drive upwards towards the 98%. Can I say to Joanne Lamont, I, I've been very critical of the Labour Party and the Health Service, basically because neither in 2007 or in the run-up to the 2011 election would they follow or commit to protecting the Health Service budget in real terms. Well, you know, I remember Lord McConnell saying every other service, including the Health Service, would have to cut its cloth because he was going to put all the consequentials into education. Now, there is another administration in these islands, a Labour administration, which decided, because of the pressure of spending cuts from Westminster, that it could not protect the health service in real terms. I have the figures for emergency care in Wales. Not in a single occasion over the last few months have they even reached 90 per cent, never mind the 93 per cent, have failed every time. In contrast, in Scotland, in contrast, in Scotland, we have rising staff in the National Health Service. We have 127,000 when we took office in September 2006, 135,000 at the end of last year. We have rising medical staff, 9,600 to 11,438. Rising staff in nursing and midwifery, all made possible because we have protected the health service in real terms. So if the Labour record in office in this place was so lamentable, and if the record currently in Wales is so much worse than this administration, then how on earth can they have any credibility in the National Health Service? So why not welcome the investment that has been put in to drive up the figures in terms of emergency care. Welcome by the health professionals. Get behind that action plan and stop trying to rewrite the dismal history of their administration or the present practice in Wales. Question number two. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Hey. I will make the Prime Minister, I have no plans in the near future, but can I say to Ruth Davis in fairness that at the First Minister's questions on 27th of March, she asked me about the implementation of, uh, of Scottish, uh, Scottish Clare's law, that is the information that can be provided in the, the issues of uh, domestic abuse. Can uh, I tell the Chamber the Scottish Government are carefully considering the Solicitor General's proposals this morning for a new offence of domestic abuse? And also that Ruth Davis and the Chamber wish to note the Chief Constable has today proposed a multi-agency group to set up to develop a pilot on Clare's Law Disclosure Scheme in Scotland. Uh, I know that Ruth Davison will welcome these initiatives and I can assure her they will be carefully considered as they unfold. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank the First Minister and welcome the pilot of Clare's Law, which I raised with the First Minister on the 27th of March. And while he's in a listening mood, may I also ask him to reconsider my repeated calls for a full public inquiry into the Baby's Ashes scandal. Uh, yeah. Presiding Officer, the First Minister seemed awfully keen just a few moments ago to talk about Wales, but slightly less keen to talk about his own record in Scotland. And we've heard an awful lot of statistics today, but the First Minister cannot get away from the facts. He missed his target for treating people in a &E, so he lowered his target, and then he missed it again. This isn't just about the thousands of people waiting more than four hours in a &E. It's not just about the thousand people waiting more than 12 hours. This is about everybody expecting to wait almost half an hour longer than they did just five years ago. The First Minister likes to blame almost anyone else when things go wrong. But isn't it the case that it is this SNP government which has overseen the NHS in Scotland for the past seven years. Doesn't this failure land squarely on the First Minister's desk and won't he start to take some responsibility for it? First Minister. The responsibility that we've taken for it was to announce the uh, emergency health care action plan, the £50 billion, which is making a substantial difference. I read out the quote from Martin McKechnie from this morning 
the vice, uh, the chair of uh, emergency medicine uh, in Scotland at the College of Emergency Medicine, who welcomes the action plan and the close working relationship with the health secretary, which is unveiling that action plan across Scotland. I should also say there are proposals in the Audit Scotland report, which the government will adopt and implement because they're entirely sensible. But this matter is being treated with the utmost seriousness. But I have to say, it is reasonable to put forward the situation as it was when we took office. It is reasonable to put forward the position that there are more staff, there are more nurses, there are more uh, doctors in the National Health Service. There are double, more than double the number of consultants working in accident emergency than there were when we took office, and there are far, far more being, people being treated uh, in a and &E. It is entirely reasonable to put forward these points, because all of them are true. Uh, and therefore, when this government announces that action plan, when that action plan is welcomed across the National Health Service, where there are already signs as detailed in the Audit Scotland report of an improved position, that is a government which is looking at an issue and a problem, a serious problem for many patients across Scotland, and taking affirmative action to do something about it. Ruth Davidson. Well, we know that more people are being treated. We know the NHS is under pressure. That's why the Conservatives are committed to delivering an extra 1,000 nurses for Scotland. But that doesn't get us away from the record that this SNP government is creating. A&E targets missed, nursing numbers down from their peak, bed numbers slashed by more than 20%, one of the fastest declines of hospital beds anywhere in the Western world. Last week, the Finance Secretary, John Swinney, said that this government had absolute control over the NHS. And I'll quote him. We have control to decide what type of National Health Service we want, what direction we want it to take, and what reforms we want it to undertake. So with this complete control over the NHS, are all of these cuts by SNP design? Or has the First Minister been so busy with the referendum, they've just happened by accident? First Minister. Well, the health service uh, budget has been protected uh, in real terms. That was the right decision to make. I'll defend that decision uh, in terms to anyone at any time. That hasn't been easy because of the cutbacks from Westminster, as Ruth Davidson well knows. But nonetheless, the health service budget has been protected. I think it's therefore entirely reasonable to point out that the fact that we have the staff numbers working in the NHS that I pointed out, higher than when we came to office, is a virtue of that investment. It's also true to say that the NPD programme the non-profit distribution programme across the National Health Service is leading great results. We look forward to the direct investment in Glasgow of the, the new Southern General Hospitals, and these are improving health care radically across Scotland. I think that is a substantial achievement, given the cutbacks elsewhere. Uh, I, you know, I could, you don't like talking about Wales, which is interesting, because the Prime Minister talks about little else in terms of the National <laughs> Health Service at, at Westminster. Can I point out that while we have a challenge a major challenge in some of our health boards in Scotland, an accident emergency which we are meeting, that none of our health boards uh, anywhere in Scotland are registering the 81.7 per cent, the 85.6 per cent, the 86 per cent in South End, which are being registered by health boards under pressure south of the border. Now, one of the reasons why people have confidence in this health service in Scotland is the unbending commitment of this government to fund it in real terms, but also the fact that we are committed not to fragment and privatise it like south of the border. And for any Tory politician to come to this or any other chamber and ignore the dismay that's been caused in the health service across England by the policies of our government almost beggars belief. This is a health service which will be kept in public hands. We will respond to crisis by investing more. We will meet challenges as they come, but it will be a public national health service for the people of Scotland. Supplementary from Tavis Scott. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will know that European structural funds for the Highlands and Islands are important in terms of delivering economic growth. Can he confirm that the £172 million for the new structural fund will all be spent in the Highlands and Islands and that decisions on which projects are to be supported will be taken locally rather than removing this function to Edinburgh, as Shetland Islands Council and others now fear? 
First Minister. Well, they, these matters are, are under discussion, but uh, I'm sure Tavis Scott will look uh, carefully at some of the recent uh, substantial investments being made in Shetland, not least in the airport and, and other things which I could list, uh, and will know this government's uh, substantial commitment to, to Shetland and indeed the other island communities of, of Scotland. But these decisions are under discussion at the present moment. Question number three, Willie Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. Uh, matters of importance to the people of Scotland. Well, there any. Uh, Audit Scotland said lack of hospital beds is a major problem for accident and emergency. Hospital beds are at a record low. But last week the Health Secretary said that there was not a strategic shortage of beds. Isn't it the case that his government has only really woken up to this problem two years ago? He mentioned Dr Martin McKechnie from the Royal College. That's exactly what he said this morning. Doesn't he think we are in this position because he failed to act early enough? First Minister. Well, we are in a position where quite clearly the, the waiting times are, are improving in accident and emergency, where our, our staff in accident and emergency uh, all over the country are treating more patients than ever before. We're implementing lessons where best practice is, assuring, is ensuring already very substantial results, as in Tayside and elsewhere. We're seeking, the, in terms of the infrastructure and the health service, to bring about facilities like, the, for example, the emergency care centre in Aberdeen, which is absolutely superb in terms of managing the, the flow of, of patients. These things are all happening. In terms of new facilities, they're not things that have been planned over the last 18 months. There have been continuing investment in the National Health Service over the last few years. In in terms of the action plan, it's absolutely right that the health sector, together with health professionals, put together that action plan to deal with the pressures on the National Health Service. But I think there should be some acknowledgement that this National Health Service is treating more patients than ever before, that public have fantastic confidence in our National Health Service, and they have nothing but admiration for the staff, the doctors and the nurses who are performing to such an exceptional degree. Well, he talked about um, the public hands of the NHS and keeping it in Scotland in public hands. That's exactly the point I want to tackle the First Minister on, charging people for continuing care. It announced last Friday that it was ending the principle that people who need continuing care can get it free in their community. The only way people can avoid hundreds of pounds of charges is to stay in hospital. Isn't that going to increase the pressure on bed numbers and make the waiting problem worse? He's got one half of his government trying to get people out of hospital and the other half giving them all the financial incentives to stay in hospital. That doesn't make sense, does it? First Things, uh, the Health Secretary will be making a, a statement on continuing care and explaining exactly the proposals and not the, the version which has been presented by, by Willie Rennie. And I'm sure he wants to participate uh, in that, uh, uh, in that uh, discussion. Uh, I think in terms of the success uh, which we are committed to of uh, free personal nursing care uh, in Scotland, then that would have been substantially enhanced uh, if the Westminster Government hadn't withheld the attendance allowance, which would have helped yeah. extraordinarily yeah. with the finances of that. And that, of course, was a, a, a Labour Government. And in terms of financial pressures on the National Health Service, then one of the most significant continuing pressures, which we can't unfortunately do anything about, is a disaster of the private finance initiative, which in key hospital and key hospital board across Scotland is resulting in continuing payments of eight to ten times the actual cost of hospitals because of the disastrous contracts that he and his colleagues signed when they were in government in this office. So our commitment to a public national health service is not just to protect the funding is to have a public health service not paying over the odds to private contractors. Question four, John Mason. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the increase in Scotland's population. First Minister. Well, we are very pleased indeed that Scotland's population is at its highest ever level. Healthy population growth is vital to future economic growth, and the continuing increase in our population is welcome news indeed. John Mason. I thank the First Minister for that answer. It is very encouraging that our population is at its highest ever level, but like other countries, Scotland does face demographic challenges. Does the First Minister share my regret that Westminster's UKIP-driven agenda is completely ignoring Scotland's needs and that only the powers offered by a yes vote will enable us to optimise our population and build a fairer and more prosperous society? First Minister. Yeah. I do agree with that. Uh, I, I think one of the, the signs, not, not over a few years, but over a, a century of the, 
of the failure of uh, Westminster to control the Scottish economy was the lack of population growth in Scotland over 100 years, about 10 per cent, compared to about 60 per cent population growth uh, in England. Thankfully, since the advent of this Parliament, and particularly over the last few years, these trends are reversing. They will reverse even more with an independent Scotland. I, I can't think of anything dafter as a policy, whether it's UKIP driven or not, than to educate students up to a high degree of human capital in our fine universities and then to deprive them of the opportunity yeah. to work and to contribute to our economy. Yeah. What could be a dafter policy than the one being pursued by the present Liberal Tory uh, administration at Westminster. And that's why we should welcome the fact that the new population statistics show a substantial increase in population. And I note that already in the space of, of one year, uh, they seem to be very substantially higher than the estimates that the Institute of Fiscal Studies used last uh, November. Uh, so I think we should accept if we pursue the right policies, we can get a population growth which is uh, beneficial to economic growth in Scotland. Question five, Sarah Boyack. To ask the First Minister, in the light of the reported 162 per cent increase since 2004 in the cost of providing free personal care, what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that local authorities' social work budgets can meet demand? First Minister. Well, uh, the Scottish Government is proud of the fact that free personal care improves the lives of over 77,000 older people in Scotland. We are fully committed to the policy. And I hope that when we eventually see the Labour cuts the view and it sees the light of day, that Sarah Boyart will have been successful in defending free personal care uh, as from that cuts commission set up by Joanne Lamont. Yeah. As Sarah Boyart will be aware, we protected the local government budget in relative terms, and in 2015-16, it will stand at £10.6 billion. In addition, since 2008, payments for free personal nursing care have risen in line with inflation. And the Scottish Government are also providing an additional £5 million to local authorities in 14-15 for care of older people. Sarah Boyd. Given the view of COSLA's spokesperson, SNP councillor Peter Johnson, that council social work budgets are under huge pressure, with some nearly at breaking point, what is the Scottish Government going to do to address the fact that local government revenue spendings had a real terms cut of 1.2 per cent, while costs have risen 10 per cent since 2007, with demand for care services growing, with more older people living longer? Isn't it time for the Scottish Government to sort out the squeeze in local government funding? First Minister. Well, I don't know if Sarah Boyer's working up to the fact that there is a squeeze on public spending in Scotland because of the squeeze being administered from the Westminster Government. And that is the reality. But in terms of where the various aspects of public spending have been protected, chiefly protected has been the health service for the reasons that we've already specified. Labour, of course, didn't commit to that. But second only to the health service in terms of protection of public spending has been local government. In 2006-07, when the Labour Party were in office, Joanne Lamont and, uh, and uh, others were ministers in that administration, then the percentage local government funding was 34.7 per cent. In 2014-15, it's 36.7 per cent. So yes, times are tough. How could they be otherwise? As a result of the financial crisis induced by Alistair Darling and the <laughs> Labour government, and their policies pursued of austerity from the Tory government. But local government spending has risen since the Labour Party were in power. So whatever that squeeze and difficulty is, we know it would have been a lot worse if Sarah Boyack and her colleagues had continued in office. Uh, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As the First Minister alluded to earlier, Westminster retained attendance allowance when we introduced free personal care. To date, that is around over £300 million Pounds. Surely the, the whole chamber would agree this should be returned to Scotland. Even the Labour Party, when in power here and asked the Labour question, government at Westminster, Graham. asked for that was refused. It should be returned now, surely, to help with our elderly. First Minister. Well, it is a hugely important issue. I mean, it does amount now. That's the withdrawal <laughs> of attendance allowance. If I remember right, Henry McLeish, as First Minister, said it was unfair that as a result of a Scottish Government policy, attendance allowance should be withdrawn from Scotland. And I think 
think I'm right in saying it was Jim Murphy as the Westminster Minister who said no, that we're going to keep the attendance allowance money. And over the years since then, that amounts to over £300 million, which would tell us two things. One, wouldn't it be a grand idea if we considered and controlled all aspects of policy, yeah, not just spending, but revenue and social security? And secondly, how useful would that £300 million now be to help funding the things that the Labour Party say they care about, but when in office withdrew funding from Scotland? Question six, Jimmy Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the minimum pricing plan for alcohol being referred to the EU Court of Justice. First Minister. Well, the, uh, we look forward to making the case before the European Court of Justice uh, for this vital public health tool which will help rebalance Scotland's relationship with alcohol. Each week on average in Scotland, alcohol misuse is responsible for more than 20 deaths and almost 700 hospital admissions. Minimum pricing would save lives within months of its introduction. The Scottish Government remains committed to implementing it as part of that concerted package of measures which are already being rolled out to reduce alcohol-related harm. Scotland is leading the way on this issue and I understand that the governments of Ireland and Estonia have outlined they would like to move to their own minimum unit pricing systems. Jimmy Day. Thank the First Minister for that answer. Does he recall the wise words of the European Health Commissioner Borg when he said that he was in favour of minimum pricing in principle? Along with the empirical evidence from Canada and the support of each of the UK's chief medical officers, does this not demonstrate further that minimum pricing is essential if we are to reduce alcohol-related harm, cut violent crime and save lives in Scotland? First Minister. Well, uh, uh, we welcome the, the backing uh, in principle of minimum unit pricing from the European Health Commissioner. Uh, as the member points out quite rightly, this adds to the very substantial weight of support for the policy, particularly from those who work daily with the effects of alcohol misuse and abuse. Minimum unit pricing took place in Canada and it has resulted in reductions in alcohol-related harm. A 10 per cent increase in minimum price has led to an estimated 32 per cent reduction in wholly alcohol-attributable deaths. I said I welcome the referral to the, uh, to the European Court. I look forward to implementing minimum unit pricing, a policy which the evidence shows will save lives. Thank you. That ends First Minister's question. We now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.